very much sense for Mutstroms to try to to try to land softly here this year. Uh, very close to where we were together with you in person last year. We're just a few stone throws from the spawning site. Uh -huh. I think you had a you had a glimpse today of some of the spawning that's going on there. Uh, I sent you something. I'm not sure if you had a chance to see it. But um, okay. and Peringvar is here, and many, many dear friends are here. Freudis is here as well. Um, a room full of, of dear friends, uh, new, new and old. And um, all evening I've received words from people feeling, uh, giving expression that it's a bit like coming home to some. Uh, it's, it, it's a bit like a family gathering. Um, but in a sense, without the nuisance ones, <laughs> there's there's warmth here. There's fire. There's good food. Uh, uh, a friend, uh, Tadia, he'd been mushroom picking just before, oh. and uh, he found heaps and heaps, and ended up sharing with all of us. Um, we've had offerings of song. We've had the offering of the conversation with stone by Katarina, which you've been very curious and excited about, David. Yeah. And. Um, yeah, and the honorary guests are in the river spawning. Though I do sometimes wonder who's who is guest to whom, or whether perhaps we we can be as much home in, in each other's presence and guests to each other just as well. Yes, and um, it's an immense joy to have you with us again today. Oh, it's delightful to be here. I'm I'm missing Arne as well. And how each time I would see him after having been uh, an ocean and half a continent apart, he would start punching me and boxing. Even when he was stuck in a wheelchair, he'd start boxing. Hi, <laughs> hi. Um, uh, but an amazing, what an amazing soul, um, childlike uh, intelligence so rich so playful so mischievous um and at once deeply deeply mature and incredibly childlike he he never lost that that deep sense of his own earliest years yeah yeah so what shall we speak about <laughs> well Hey, David. It's Perring Mar. Good to oh, see brother. you. Hey, so brother. So good to see you, too. Good to see you as well. So <clears throat> I know that um, usually when we have this um, Zoom, you are uh, back home in your beautiful home, but you're now uh, in at Harvard. Is that the case? You're teaching, guest teaching there. So maybe yes. you could share a little bit of what you're doing these days. But also, I think that... For, for many of us here, perhaps, are not all acquainted with your work. And just to, to remind us that, you know, David is really one that brings the deep ecology movement forward. And he was also the one that coined the term more than human, and uh, which has now gone around the world. And, and, and you really, truly uh, are a um, pioneer in the, in, the, in the deep ecology, and we've been speaking of it in the Alliance for Wild Ethics, also as a depth ecology. So I think that, in a way, plus, you're a magician. You're a hamshifter. You would be a noide or a side in the, in the Norse uh, <laughs> cultures because you are truly a magician in how we could shift perspectives. So in a way, I think it's, um, it'd be good to have a little bit of, maybe a little bit of history, how you came into this. Uh, through deep ecology and and to depth ecology in a way and maybe moment oh yeah someone is calling you yeah someone was calling me um bring them i don't in know how to yeah bring him in <laughs> <laughs> so it's my son leander uh so um, oh, there he is oh give him uh, uh, my love yeah but also just uh, you know the spell of the sensuous is a, is a absolutely classic which is an important, extremely important book, and also Becoming Animal, which is the, the last book that I think... Uh, so, yeah, you can take it anywhere you'd like, actually, but it would be good to uh, start out with a little bit. 
from uh, yeah, I'll just outside. Keep declining this, and at some point, Leander will get the message. Um, <laughs> ah. <laughs> Uh, so, um, oh, goodness. Stop. Yeah. There, he stopped. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, gosh, there's help, help, and being attacked through my computer. Um, so, yeah, I, um, what to say? My, I, I, I'm a cultural ecologist, which sort of combines um, anthropology with ecology, um, and and I'm a philosopher, or what some folks are now calling a geo philosopher. That is somebody who's trying to work out the ways of thinking under the influence of the more than human Earth. Um, can we find ways of speaking? ways of thinking that don't tear us out of our co-evolved carnal embedment in this blooming, buzzing proliferation of shape and texture and many voiced life, but ways of speaking that actually hold us in intimate rapport and reciprocity with the living land, with all the other animals that inhabit the land with the plants as well and also with the with the winds and the weather powers and and the ground and the mountains and the forests and the rivers um too often when we speak it seems to tear us out of this fabric so by just entering into language and talking with neighbors with our family with friends we find ourselves sort of hovering outside the world like a spectator looking at a spectacle. We spend so much time talking about uh, what's happening to the earth, about the weather today, about things, but we don't so much talk to the wind. We don't talk to the ground or to the river. Um, rather, we seem to think that that only we have language. And so uh, we have to talk about everything else behind its back, as it were. It's rather insulting to the other beings. But I'm curious if there are ways of speaking that, that bind our animal senses back into the earthly sensuous. Because I, my particular fascination really is with the ecology of sensory experience, the way the activity of our eyes and our ears and our skin functions to, yes, bind our nervous system into the wider ecosystem. Um, as if perception itself was a kind of glue that um, sutures us into the living land, embeds us ever more deeply into the animate earth around us. But I am also fascinated just as much with what we could call the ecology of language, how our ways of speaking um, so profoundly influence our ways of seeing or our ways of hearing or even smelling or tasting the earth around us. Um, I'm convinced that there are many ways of speaking that most of us inherited from this goofy civilization into which we were educated, um, ways of speaking that really um, stifle our senses, that close down our um, instinctive rapport between our body and the breathing flesh of the land around us. But I'm just as convinced that there are, as I was just saying, ways of speaking that are waiting for us now, that are, are, are seeking out uh, people who will begin to speak or let them speak through them. Ways of speaking that can really open and encourage that spontaneous kinship between our animal senses and the animate earth. And so that's the broad terrain 
wherein I work and dance. Um, Praying Var, you mentioned, um, yeah, I'm teaching now at, at Harvard uh, just for the year for a visiting position, but it is startling um, to find my work uh, called upon and, and folks reaching out for me to teach here because when I published my first book, The Spell of the Sensuous, um, I got a lot of shit from the academic world. Um, it was hugely um, derided and um, um, uh, made fun of, as it were, because I was calling for a renewal, a resurgence of animism, um, that we needed to think uh, very deeply and, and really ponder the possibilities of animistic ways of speaking, ways of seeing. By the term animism, uh, I mean simply that old indigenous uh, intuition that everything is alive, that everything is alive. Us, yes, the other animals, sure, even the plants, of course, deeply alive, but even, even whole forests, even the river has its sentience, its vitality, its, its life, its intelligence. Even a dry riverbed is assumed to be alive by so many of our indigenous sisters and brothers and ancestors. Um, even the winds and the weather patterns, invisible though they are around us, these gusting winds themselves um, are felt to be animate, alive. So I was suggesting in that work that, that this is a terribly important way of experiencing the world. It is our most ancestral, most basic sort of baseline for the human species was to was to assume and allow that everything is animate, that everything moves. It's just that some things move a lot slower than other things, like the walls of this room where I sit or the room where you guys are sitting or the ground underneath the foundations of that building. It moves very slowly, but it still moves. It's still animate is still alive. Um, and although this uh, insistence I had that we needed to really resuscitate this very old way of seeing and of speaking, although this was derided and um, made fun of by uh, the academic world for, for years, it's now... Um, spread all over the place and is being taught in many, many disciplines within uh, the academy. And um, there's so much burgeoning interest in it, even here at Harvard University, that I'm asked to please come and teach um, and uh, speak and, and, uh, and, and open rich discussions on these matters. And so my tomorrow I'll be taking out uh, a clutch of uh, faculty as well as postdoctoral students out into uh, the land somewhere near here and we'll spend a day out there um, just in some simple practices to sort of coax even these very brilliant intellectual uh, humans uh, to coax them back into their animal bodies and um, and see what is it to let one's intellect um, draw its inspiration steadily from the whole, whole of the body. What is it to think as a full-bodied animal and not just as a mind that's housed inside your skull? So there's a few thoughts just to open the conversation. Oh, thank you. Fantastic. 
You know, I, I was thinking we could also uh, open it for a question, but what I uh, what I want to tell you is um, a little bit of some of the themes that we have in this uh, conference or this uh, festival. And one right. one theme is, and you may you know comment on it, but there well there are many themes. Uh, one is of course the storytelling, but also the expressions of these deep felt connection without words. You know, through art and and through dance and movement and other forms of expression, which I think is is uh, very promising. It, it really we had a fantastic performance here just a little while ago, and 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 just it it, it was so precise. It couldn't have been sp spoken more precise in some sense. It's that that mm. kind of connection is wonderful. So that's one area, and then the other area I think is we're we're searching for um, a sense of connection between the individual everyday practices of reconnecting or or, or re-enchanting the world with also a sense of community so what 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 is the what is the way of community or how do we really um speak to the communities that we live which is a more than human community what are these multi-species neighborhoods that we are how can we really work with that in some sense so that's w another theme and then i think i guess a third is this eco sorrow the the notion of eco sorrow or grief you know the the ecological grief we'll be discussing and talking and sharing of tomorrow and the final theme i don't know this is a, th a theme that you've been working on quite a bit and i'm quite curious as to how you see that and that is uh, about the relationship between indigenous ways of seeing and knowing and being <coughs> and how we <coughs> are, let's say, in the Sami or in the North Norway, we, we have the uh, connection between the Sami indigenous population and also ethnic Norwegians. How can we reconnect to our sense of indigeneity so that we, in a way, communicate on some equal level, not culturally appropriating the the Sami ways, but actually renewing, reviving our own sense of indigeneity. So that's some themes, I think, is coming up. Beautiful. Well, just a few tiny thoughts sparking off of that. Um, it does, you know, I, it, it feels to me that um, since we all have our indigenous ancestry, in fact, since our ancestors, in, indeed, we humans lived for 99% of our human tenure within the biosphere as hunters, foragers, gatherers, fisher folk in rich, intimate relation with the more than human community of beings um, that to, to, to awaken our own indigeneity, um, it suffices um, to just get closer and closer and as close as you can, it seems to me, to your own animal body um, that is to really take pleasure in the way your body moves, to um, to try and sink your awareness down from, yes, the nether reaches of your skull into your muscles, feeling uh, and identifying with the heart beating in your chest, but also with your stomach um, as it digests food, with your toes, uh, as they walk through the terrain, that is learning to uh, reanimate or reawaken the consciousness or the subjectivity of the body itself, instead of thinking of ourselves as minds that inhabit bodies or subjects that are just sort of stuck here, uh, imprisoned in the body, or maybe we think of the body as a kind of temple for the soul. But it's not just a temple. It's not just a house. It's not the body is the soul. The body is the subject of all our experience. It is this body 
here that is speaking to you right now with my tongue flapping between my teeth. Um, so just playing with, experimenting with the pleasure of being a full-bodied animal. Human, yes, but an animal nonetheless, and hence in many ways just one of the gang, because it seems to me that it's our palpable, tangible thingness, our, our body that gives us access to all these other bodies of uh, squirrels and humpback whales and salmon. Yes, it's my body that has a lot in common with the mountain as well, or with a tree or uh, a fungus growing on that tree. My body has a lot in common, even with a storm cloud thickening in the sky overhead, because that too is a body. So to, um, to drop one's awareness into one's material fleshly presence um, is, it seems to me, one key clue. Um, and, and one other thought in regard to what um, you were just sharing, Perengbar, um, you, you spoke of community and the more than human community, the neighborhood, and you use that wonderful word neighborhood. There is, and I'm sure this is ridiculously obvious to all of you, um, but, uh, and still, um, it bears saying that place and a sense of the locale and a sort of renewed awareness of the power of one's place on the earth and what that region, that valley, that watershed there near the banks of the Aka River, um, what its particular styles are that are different from any other place, even within that continent where you guys are situated, um, and how very different it is from here, where I am now, or from the high desert of New Mexico, where I normally live with my family, um, that each place, um, well, let me step back for a moment and just say, when I taste the world with my bodily senses all awake, my animal senses, um, to come to my senses, as it were, is to, is to start noticing the nuances and subtleties of the local terrain immediately around me. The sensuous world is not what's happening on the other side of the continent right now. It's not what's happening in uh, China. It's not what's going on in the Middle East, even though I'm very concerned with events unfurling right now in Israel. The sensuous world is the world immediately around me here um, in this curious land um, and the world immediately around you folks. Uh, what's very strange is that our localities, our places are are intersecting right now as a result of the internet and Zoom. But we shouldn't let that distract us from the simple truth that the primary uh, place, the primacy of the sensuous is the palpable primordial reality of the living land, wherever we find ourselves, and the other humans that inhabit that, inhabit that place with us, along with all the other critters that inhabit that terrain, and the plants growing there, the rooted peoples, the trees and the herbs and the forest edges, um, and the wolves howling and waking us up in the morning. Um, but that the place has a kind of primacy, a kind of primary reality or value for us. So um, um, this simple words of Wendell Berry says, there are no 
unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Mm. Yeah, so other thoughts? Too many, and perhaps some just need to be breathed through. Um, I can't hear you, Brother Martin. Perhaps I'll just speak a bit louder, David. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, of course, you know, she asks this question that is, can you hear me? Uh, only very faintly. I wonder why. Speak a little louder if you can, yeah. If I speak into the computer, will you hear me better then? Or? That's much clearer, yes. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this is the, the microphone. So this, this will be the seat for question asking then, perhaps. Or, or, or you can just take the microphone and start to eat it, like put it inside <laughs> your mouth and I'll probably hear it. My, my daughter was just uh, demonstrating to a friend of hers this morning of how small dad's mouth is. So I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think eating a... Oh, look, at it, it's, it's, so, it's so interesting. You should check it out. Papa, show you your mouth. Um, <laughs> you know, Robin Wall Kimra, she asked this question about how in this time of ours can we really, really perceive of this world as, as being a gift? In, the, in an existential sense again, and connecting to what you speak about also, how can we have an experiential knowledge again of the world is sacred? Um, and then I love what you say, that there are no unsacred places, only sacred places and desecrated places. Mm -hmm. And um, it reminds me of um, one of the origins of the word sacred uh, being in sacrifice as this gifting forward of something so precious that it actually may hurt you. Or as mm -hmm. in the case of these fish who are spawning right now and who are, you know, who have completed, almost completed this incredible journey, in many cases it will kill them. Not all of them will die, but many of them will die. And that, in a sense, is, is an ultimate sacrifice. It's yeah. a way in which, through the simple act of living out the arch of their lives, they embody the sacred and they bring this quality of the sacred right here into our midst and are, in a sense, posing in their actions, in their gestures, a question to how will we reciprocate that ultimate gift as human animals, as two-legged, weirdly naked, um, animals who would shiver to death if we didn't, you know, cover ourselves with the hides of other animals or, or with plants or with the fibers of plants. Mm -hmm. But um, that's a, an, a big question that perhaps you could also reflect a little bit about with us, David, of what are acts of reciprocating the sacred gifts of these bodies in the land who are living out their arches? What are human expressions to weave ourselves back into this commonwealth, into this neighborhood? I love the folky sound of uh, the, the neighborhood of kin mm -hmm. that you brought in, Petting. But yeah, just that. Well, surely one secret to. Um, feeling the world once again as a gift and it's many many gifts is to be offering your own gifts back to the world in fact um we speak at least in english uh, i don't know if it's true in norwegian but in english we say that uh, a person who has a particular talent or skill um is gifted. Uh, she's been gifted, uh, or she's a gifted musician, or he's a very gifted painter. But um, it is sort of the deep teaching of one's gifts, of being gifted, is that you have to give your gift. Otherwise, it gets stuck and begins to make you sick. 
if you're not giving of your gifts, whatever they are, you know, um, and it doesn't have to be something that you are so incredibly talented at, but just that you're like the salmon being generous with, um, with what you can offer, with what you can bring forth. And in fact, every person is multiply gifted. Um, but if you have and know that you've got a gift for art, for, for music, um, for storytelling, for poetry, then it's been one of the goofs of our era that um, that you didn't feel like you could just give it to the world. You felt, and too many people around me here feel like they have to sell their gifts. You have to, um, if you've got a particular talent, um, then you must make money at it, um, which of course impedes and interferes with the simple gesture of offering to the world um, of your gift. I think, um, yeah, that's one small thought I'd like to offer in is that, um, of course, it's important to, to find ways to support yourself, your family, um, but always leave some of your, um, your earthborn gifts to just be given without any wish for recompense, without any need for an immediate return. Um, Cause that is something, um, that's what makes community. And it's what also um, is felt, I feel, by the earth, by the land where we live. Um, um, but yeah, you're speaking of this, this term sacred and sacrifice and making sacred, um, which is also what the word sacrifice means, uh, to make sacred. And, um, but yeah, I hear that phrase from Wendell Berry, there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. So it's really a question of how is it that we've managed to desecrate so much of our world um, or to uh, frame the world in such a way that we're not experience, experiencing its utter innate, you know, inexhaustible weirdness and wonder and bodacious magic at every turn. And I think um, this, among other things, it does have a lot to do with language, with how we speak. Um, when we speak of the world as a set of objects and objective mechanical processes, uh, we're kind of speaking in a way um, that closes our senses uh, to the world. Um, it's speaking of the things around us and the beings around us as if, as if they do not harbor within them uh, 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 a secret, a mystery that we cannot fathom because even that blade of grass it's different. It's so different from me. I mean, it's a plant for one thing. It eats sunlight, which is mighty different from my ways of drawing energy. Um, but it eats sunlight while slurping up moisture from the soil underneath. Um, what does that feel like? There is so much to even a blade of grass that is outrageously different from being a human being. And this would be true 
of a coyote as well would be true of of a deer um, of, of uh, an aspen tree each of these so strange in our experience and i can't possibly know what it is to be this aspen tree but by virtue of being a body myself i can lean into it i can suss out something of what it might feel like to be slurping up moisture with my toes from under the ground, even while I am drinking the sunlight with, with my leaves, um, um, because my body is a variant of its body. In fact, my body is a variation of every other palpable bodily presence, every other animal, every plant, but even every stone or block or brick that went into the building you folks are sitting in. And so um, um, instead of speaking the world as a set of objects, um, um, this simple gesture of allowing that each thing has its own radiance, its own inner uh, animation, its own pulse, its own rock and roll, its own dance, its own way of dancing itself into the present moment, even a brick, even a gust of wind. Um, this is a way of speaking that opens our senses onto the sensuous in all its multiform weirdness. And um, it opens our senses to the strangeness, the enig enigmatic otherness of things and of the world around us. So I think that's kind of a key, probably one every one of you is already exploring or practicing in some way or other. Forgive me for reiterating that, but another aspect of speaking is, well, I alluded to it in the beginning, uh, instead of just speaking about about the land, about the weather, about the wind gusting through the city streets, every now and then talking to the world, talking to the ground underfoot, um, calling the sun up out of the ground in the morning, as so many of the native peoples on this continent at least do. They call the sun up, they sing it up out of the eastern ground every morning. Um, even this, the word prayer, it seems to me primordially in its most basic aboriginal origin, prayer is simply talking to the world rather than only talking about the world. And so talking to things now and again, even though your neighbors may think you're crazy, doesn't matter. Um, um, it's a good way of bringing your senses into attunement with the senses of the other beings around you and the sensuous qualities of those beings. But finally, if we're speaking about ways of speaking, story and telling stories is so key. And um, I'm sure you've had some stories already uh, being told there at this gathering, and I'm sure there'll be more through the weekend, um, but um, just the importance of storytelling um, and of sharing story, not just reading stories from books, uh, stories that we've written down and carry in books, but putting the books aside now and then and improvising a story with the whole of your animal body, telling a story in place. In fact, pulling your kids uh, out of doors and weaving a story about, about, you know, just what happens inside that forest edge every full moon over there, or 
here at the edge of, of the river. Um, what do you think the river itself is feeling like? And when the fish return to its waters. Um, telling stories, not just reading stories, but telling stories with our whole body. Because when we read a tale, no other animal gets to participate in the story and no other animal hears the telling and, and can, can read the words on the page. But when you tell a story with your whole flesh, well, birds swooping past can enter right into the telling of the tale. And a coyote or a squirrel who is just crossing nearby hears something of that voice. And if you're telling the story well, the squirrel may get really interested and hop closer. Um, and even the trees and the trunks of the trees hear some of the dark earth tones in your telling if you let your, your voice sink low now and then. Telling stories, too, is a way of binding ourselves back into the land, but especially telling place-based stories, stories that live in particular places at this bend in the river or just at that spawning place where the salmon return to every year. Storying up the terrain, telling stories out of doors with our whole bodies and gathering people for the telling in the right time of year, storying up the land. There's no restoring the earth without restoring the earth, without restoring the earth. So for me, that is and remains one of the most crucial and potent and yet very playful ways of re-enchantment is rejuvenate oral culture, rejuvenate uh, the culture of face-to-face -face and face-to-place storytelling out in the land or even there in this good place honoring Arnines, um, but feeling the whole more than human place around you and the moon's gaze upon the roof and the winds as they lick the walls of that place and bringing them into the stories you share there. Mm. I hope I'm making some kind of goofy sense. Are there any questions bubbling up over there? Yeah. Hi, David. Hello. Uh, I don't know if you can see me. Hi. Thank you for the last time uh, you were in Be. I uh, listened to you then as well. Oh, um, great. I, I was actually going to ask you about the importance of stories and the importance of fiction, because I know you're a storyteller and you're an author. Um, and you already have talked about that, but... Um, maybe you can tell us what you think about the importance of fiction, not just in um, sort of reigniting or reimagining an animistic world of view, but also in conceptualizing a future in which it's a bigger part of all of our lives and a bigger part of our society. Uh, and also I want to challenge you on uh, do you think written fiction also has a, a place there, a value there? Thank you. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, I, I like the challenge. Um, and I'm excited that you feel that there's an important place for um, story writing as well. And of course there is. And um, I'm a writer as well. Yes, I'm an author. Um, but I'm, I'm not wanting to uh, in any way insult or put down the written word. I love books. <laughs> I love books. Um, and I love reading. And writing 
is sometimes a pain in the neck, but I love it too. Um, it's just that I want to say that the art of storytelling practiced with our whole body, not in relation to the page and not in relation to the screen of a computer, that that too has to be practiced and brought back. And it seems to me that too many of us now that we've learned how to read and to write and um, and now that we've uh, learned our uh, digital literacy, too many of us just leave out the craft of oral telling, um, of face-to-face -face and face-to-place sharing of stories. The thing is, you know, um, once you write a story down, then that story can be taken to other places and can be read in distant cities and, um, and even on distant continents. And all the place-specific richness and strangeness that once lived in that oral tale and that lives in the uh, stories of any deeply place-based Aboriginal, indigenous, or re-indigenized culture. Um, all of that place-specific richness gets um, forgotten in the story as it's carried in books into other places and into other uh, cities and to other continents so that here in North America, I mean, I'm here at Harvard right now, big university on the East Coast, but the students studying here, uh, getting their undergraduate uh, degrees at Harvard are studying the same things that the folks are studying in Stanford on the West Coast in California. And, and, and they're studying in their various disciplines, the same things that those disciplines are teaching at the University of Colorado in the middle of the continent, because for us, knowledge floats free of place. It lives in books. It lives between the pages of books. Um, I wish I had more here to, to, share, to show you, but um, I, I've got lots on the wall opposite. Um, because knowledge for us is held in books. And now it's held in cyberspace and through the screens of our computers. Um, but I want to say, yeah, there's a lot of incredible wisdom between the covers of these books. But it rests upon and it's still secretly rooted in the land, in particular places where those wisdoms first burgeoned forth. And so literate culture is kind of great. It's a marvel as long as it doesn't leave out oral culture, the culture of face-to-face -face storytelling and face-to-place storytelling. Um, um, again, when we're only reading and writing, other animals don't have to participate in our practice of, of uh, storying um, and whether we're writing fiction or nonfiction. But if we're telling stories and if we're listening to stories and if we're also dancing up the land um, and singing it up, um, the other animals, the plants, they hear, they feel something of this celebration and it jazzes them up and fires them up too. So, um, brother, I don't know your name who asked that question. I think you're so right. And, and the work of fiction writing, the, the dreamy, imaginative work of envisioning other ways to be other ways to live, 
other ways to live with one another and to live with hawks and salmon and spiders and humpback whales. This is such key, key work. But we're living at a time when the actual salmon are dwindling and the humpbacks are dwindling and the hawks are circling around wondering what's become of the trees where they used to nest because many of them have been clear cut. In fact, the world, the palpable more than human earth of our bodies felt experience is, uh, is becoming more and more painful. It's carrying more and more wounds within it. And for many folks, it's just, it's too fucking painful. And so if they can find a space where they can just hang out online in virtual spaces or climb into a book or climb into stories and just live there in those stories that proliferate now more and more online and people are fabricating virtual possibilities so that we can actually feel and see the colors in that world. And I don't really have to step out my door at all. I think, you know, maybe you can see that this is also a real danger. And maybe it's also a reason that the land around us has been ailing for so long, because our fascination has been elsewhere. Our fascination has been in these other worlds. So um, I don't mean to be uh, denigrating the world of the written word and literary culture, nor denigrating the internet and the online world. It's making possible this rich meeting between you guys and myself right now. But just to say that if we are engaging these um, more abstract layers of community, and of the self, because this is these are layers of ourselves. If we're engaging these more abstract layers of community, we have to also be sure that we're also feeding that baseline, full-bodied, earthly layer of community and culture, which is the oral uh, layer of face-to-face -face and face-to-place. Storytelling, singing, dancing, honoring the beings in their full-bodied presence as as we meet them under the sky. Yeah. Hey, thank you, brother. Now, we have one more question. Uh, it's OK to take one more, and then we'll maybe wrap up if, if there may be some other Thank you. Well, it was three questions, but I'll shorten it to one. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. It's such an inspiration to hear um, the way yeah, the way you are um, describing your story and your journey. And of course, uh, I'm very glad that you're going to take those uh, academic elites out in the nature. That's going to be so necessary. I myself, uh, I'm, my name is Sajjad, I'm from Iran. The last 11 years in Norway, I've had a good chance to go into many animalistic uh, trances that has released a lot. And I have really come close into this direct limits and constraints that language has in order to describe uh, the experiences that one experiences in a, in a trance. So in some moment of creativity, I saw that how in the deep grammar of language we have struggles because in most languages that I'm familiar with we kind of distinguish between the subject and the object and somehow the verb gets in the way so I've kind of been working a little bit on a, on a new grammar that focuses on the verb or the action or the the animation the violence the anger the joy that runs through an animal or a body and of course mm -hmm. I need all the help I can <laughs> on that front so I'll be reaching out to you but for me, I have been seeing it most as a part of the eco-feminist movement. Uh, so I wonder in what ways do you see 
uh, your discourse uh, converging with the ecofeminism that's uh, kind of roughly been organized in that term. In what ways do you find synergy with that? And then I'll drop the second question. Thank you. Uh, I mean, you can you can bring your other question forward too. Um, it does, or and and um, I just I I feel like I am in full convergence and solidarity um, with ecofeminism, with feminism itself, as long as we allow that the feminine is not just in the human. It is in so many species. Uh, um, and so that we are in solidarity with the women of every species and with the mothers who bear and bring forth life. In a sense, um, my strange emphasis, uh, you know, I've been leaning into here this evening, surprising me as well with it, actually. Um, I've not been speaking this way here very much, but surprising myself to hear how much emphasis I'm putting on the body and full-bodied ways of uh, storying and sensing and experiencing um, is to honor the materiality of our being. Um, not just the spirituality, but to let the spiritual richness of uh, one's life, of one's experience, be part and parcel of this material flesh. But you see, to, to honor matter is, if you listen to the word matter with your animal ears, you notice it's the same word as mater mother. In English, both derived from the old word matrix, which meant womb. And there's a sense in which matter is the womb of all things. Um, and so to be coming deeply into the sensuous, into the earth um, as a living presence, is, uh, it seems to me, to be not just honoring, but to really be invoking, calling back, and opening a sense of the power and primacy of the feminine, of a world filled with goddesses as well as gods, and um, and there's a sense that this earth is a womanish world. I hope that word is coming across um, uh, through your speaker, womanish, W-O-M-B-ish. That we live, we live not just on the earth, you know? We live down here immersed in this ocean of air or atmosphere as thoroughly as those salmon are immersed in the waters of the river, as thoroughly as other fish are immersed in the ocean, we live in this ocean of air, in this amniotic uh, fluid, which is just to say, um, I'm sort of sparking off your question and carrying it elsewhere to say something I really do want to say is that we don't live on the earth. We live in the earth. We live down here immersed in the depths of this breathing, of this breathing physiology, this living sphere, this immense spherical metabolism in which our individual bodies are all entangled and embedded. We don't, we don't live on walk on the surface of the earth those clouds way up there there that's earth up there they accompany the earth as it turns we live down here in the deep of this earth that's also what you know my sense of deep ecology is about 
or depth ecology, that we're in the depths of the ecology. We are in the depths of this nature that our sciences for too long have taught us to look at as if we were outside nature, as if we were hovering in a kind of disembodied God's eye view, hovering outside the earthly world, looking at it from outside. We're not outside. We're in it, inside it, and it's vast. And it's, it's holy. It's massively sacred. But that's not to say it's, it's, um, it's nice. <laughs> it's, 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 it's fucking dangerous to be awake, to wake your senses up to the immensity and the immense mystery of this earth who is, um, you know, she's wild. She's not sweet. <laughs> she's a witch um, uh, who can be quite ruthless and often sacrifices us like this. Um, but she's very, very, very beautiful, this power she or he or it or however one characterizes this breathing mysterium this vast immense spinning world this whirling dervish of an earth that we all live within yeah thank you very much thank you brother and thank you so much for your gift to us been true truly gift and uh, we're very very you know very deeply grateful that you took the time to be with us and um, oh of course yeah. give me a break of course I know Anytime. I know you love it <laughs> you I mean we could hang out here for hours I know that so no, no, I, no it's really late there I know that yeah. and I I want to say I'm very grateful to you all for hanging out this late in the evening and um and to, to be in some conversation and interplay with me. Thanks so much. And thank you, uh, Martin for, and, and, and Stina for being the, um, uh, the wrestlers gathering this amazing gathering together to honor that place and to honor the salmon. And th thank you so much to my, wonderful brother Per Ingvar and Per Espen and all the other sisters and brothers there. Um, so have a most wonderful um, seasonal celebration of what really matters, not just us two-leggeds, but all mm -hmm. the other wild creatures mm -hmm. that we share this place with. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dave.